yes, yes, Hi, yes, Andrew. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, now that Andrew's here, we're gonna go ahead and get started. How is everybody doing today? Thank you for making it all the way over here to see this really wonderful panel. And thank you everybody uh, for joining us online. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our programs and a little bit about the report, and then I will hand it off to Sam and our panelists to discuss the report in more detail. Um, we are honored to host this discussion on a pressing global issue that is the global arms trade. My name is B. Arneson. I am the Director of Arms Trade and Militarization at the World Peace Foundation. Our program seeks to expose the corrupt and anti-democratic practices that are rife within the arms trade and work to end it. The World Peace Foundation is a research foundation affiliated with Tufts University in Boston, Massachusetts. Through justice-informed research, we aim to change public conversations on pressing issues related to envisioning, creating, and sustaining nonviolent futures. Campaign Against Arms Trade is a UK-based organization that seeks to end the international arms trade with a particular focus on the UK arms trade and industry. The program that gathers us here today is part of ongoing research program at the World Peace Foundation that originally began in 2020. It's funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and it currently focuses on revitalizing the debate on the global arms trade, which is a multifaceted program that aims to invigorate debate and policy about the arms trade through integrating the trade into other areas of policy, research, and activism, and through the engagement of a younger generation. CAT has been a valued partner of ours throughout the entire program. And we're here to discuss an exciting new report titled From Revolving Door to Open Plan Office, the Ever Closer Union Between the UK Government and the arms industry. You know us academics and activists really like to make our titles very long. <laughs> Um, it's authored by CATS research coordinator, Dr. Sam Perlow Freeman. And this report is very, very important because it's the most comprehensive analysis of the weapon industry's influence on the British government, which, as Sam re will reveal shortly, can no longer be understood as a merely a revolving door between government and industry, but has merged to the point where we can now call it an open plan office. If you're attending in person, you should have a little piece of colored paper on your seat. You're more than welcome to write questions for any of the panelists on that piece of paper, and Katie will pick them up before the Q&A session. Katie, can you just raise your hand for us so everybody knows who you are? Thank you so much. If you're joining us online, please submit your questions through the Q&A function. I will be looking at that as the panelists speak. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our fantastic panelists. We have invited them here today for their expertise on UK arms, the UK arms trade, and you can find their full bios on the handout or in the chat. Sam Perla Freeman, to my left, is a research coordinator at Campaign Against Arms Trade in the UK. He's an expert on UK arms exports, the political influence of the arms industry on UK government policy, world military expenditure, arms industry and trade, and corruption in the international arms trade. You really are a jack of all trades, aren't you, <laughs> Sam? <laughs> he is, as I noted above, the author of the report we're discussing today. Nico Edwards is an ESRC-funded PhD candidate in international relations at the University of Sussex. Earlier this year, she won the Adam Whaler Research Impact Award for her doctoral research on military environmentalism and eco-social justice. Nico is also an advisor to the Scientists for Global Responsibility and an expert with the Forum on the Arms Trade. And Nico has also been a big part of our program, which I mentioned before, called RDAP. Dan Saba is the Defense and Security Editor at The Guardian, a position that he's held since January 2018. He's frequently reported on arms trade issues, including UK arms trade with Saudi Arabia and Israel, and since the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 2020, he has regularly been reporting on the war direct from Ukraine. Obviously, he's here with us today, so he's here. Um, and then last, we have Andrew who has been 
a long-term partner with us as well. He's the executive director of Shadow World Investigations, a former African National Congress member of parliament from South Africa. His first book, the best-selling After the Party Corruption, the ANC in South Africa's Uncertain Future, exposed a corrupt arms deal and detailed its impact on South Africa's young democracy. He is also the author of a critically acclaimed The Shadow World Inside the Global Arms Trade. So now that we've met all of our really amazing panelists, we're ready to learn more about the report. So I'm gonna hand it off to Sam so that he can tell us a little bit about the report and then we'll talk with our panelists. Thank you very much, B. Um, thanks to, to all the panelists for, for joining us and thanks to all of you, uh, both uh, in person and online for, for coming to hear uh, about this report. Um, so I suppose you could say that uh, this work on, you know, the influence of the arms industry on, on government started out from a question of, well, how does the arms industry get away with it? And it's a question that Kat started asking um, about 20 years ago, uh, as, you, you, you know, why consistently, despite its rhetoric about human rights and, uh, you know, international peace and security, does the government consistently come down on the side of the arms industry when it comes to really controversial decisions on arms exports, whether it was Indonesia in the 1990s, um, uh, Israel in the early 2000s, and India and Pakistan, later Saudi Arabia, of course, for a very long time, and now Israel once again when they've uh, stopped all the arms supplies to Israel, except the most important arms supplies to Israel, the F-35 um, uh, components. And we, we, we've got a lot of material out about that. That came out after this report was written, but entirely fits with the pattern that we're talking about. Um, and I described the government's decision as a bit like saying that you're going vegetarian except for bacon. Um, <laughs> And, you, you know, the argument that often comes up is about jobs. But when you look at it, and as we'll see some of these numbers, it really doesn't add up. And so what Kat started working on about 20 years ago and produced some of the initial research uh, that this is a successor to, um, updating and extending, uh, they said, well, it must be basically because the industry has the government in its pocket. And it produced a lot of... Uh, evidence on this, on the revolving door from government to industry, on um, the extensive meetings and the institutional arrangements. Um, and as, as I say, a lot of what's in this report is following on from this uh, and bringing it up to date and, uh, well, as well as um, a lot of new material as well, I hope. And now I think that that's a bit of an oversimplification because it's really a two-way street when you're talking about the government and the industry and their mutual interests, um, as, as I'll be talking about. But I think it, it is an incredibly important part of the equation of why the arms industry gets away with this outrageous exports when we know that they're going to be used to commit atrocities. And then when you come closer to home, where I, whenever you see the Parliamentary Defence Committee meeting about MOD procurement and discussing it, just reading the transcripts, you can almost hear the MPs tearing out their hair at why uh, programs are so consistently late and over budget and sometimes not even doing what they're supposed to be doing when they are delivered and they always call it a broken system which it is except not if you're the arms industry if you're BAE Systems or Rolls-Royce or um, or Babcock or Kinetic, then it's a system that is actually working extremely well. And if you're their shareholders, it's a system that's working extremely well. Um, and so again, 
how the arms industry gets away with that, with the same companies continually getting these mega contracts despite a litany of failures. And you don't need to be a peacenik to say that. This are, these are defence hawks, a lot of them, sitting on the Defence Committee and tearing their hair out at the failures of, of MOD procurement. So when we talk about arms industry influence, well, lots of industries try to influence government, often quite successfully, fossil fuel industries. Uh, the privatised water companies have obviously done a number on off what the, the water regulator um, when they literally get away with pouring vast quantities of shit into our rivers and uh, oceans and paying pathetic levels of fines which are basically just the cost of doing business and still giving huge payouts to their shareholders. So the arms industry is far from unique in this. But I think that there are, it is unique in some ways. Um, and, and this will lead to some of the themes of this report. It is not like any other industries. It is seen as an absolutely crucial strategic asset by the government for enabling the UK to have the weapons, to be able to produce its own weapons to its own designs to project power around the world. It's, uh, and in that sense, its strategic importance is seen as being far, far out of proportion to its economic size. And so it's not just about industry looking for ways to influence the government as an outside actor. The government has, of its own choice, successive governments, Labour and Tory, chosen to pull the arms industry into an ever closer embrace as what it believes clearly as a way of promoting these strategic interests, so whether it succeeds in doing that is another matter. Um, and this has given the industry an unparalleled level of access to the highest levels of government. And so these other industries attempt to influence government, often very successfully in particular ways. The arms industry isn't influencing from outside, it's influencing from inside. It is constantly round the table having its views heard. So in a sense, it doesn't need to go to great lengths to try to influence it. The government is inviting this influence. And what we've said here is that the line between government and industry has been blurred, or in the case of by far the biggest, most dominant UK arms company, BAE Systems, which has a monopoly or virtual monopoly in several areas of major arms production, that the, that line has been effectively erased, making the BAE a privately owned branch of the state, but one that, of course, is answerable to its shareholders rather than parliament or the public. So the traditional channels of influence, like the revolving door and lobbying, traditional lobbying, professional lobbying, are still important, they're relevant, but in some ways they are secondary to this deep institutional embedding of the arms industry within government. I'm going to say a little bit about the UK arms industry, just to get us, what are we talking about here? How big is it? Who are its major players? Data is sparse, but from various sources, rough ballpark, the total revenue of the arms industry from specifically military production, about 23 billion a year, maybe, based on some of the surveys we've seen, maybe 25, it's hard to be exact. It's hard to know exactly what are the boundaries of the arms industry. That, that's a whole other topic, which is discussed a bit in the report. Direct employment, so employees directly involved in producing for the government or for export customers, 100 to 110,000 maybe, and then probably a similar number in the supply chains. 
arms exports, eight to 10 billion a year, depending on how you measure it. The data is really poor, that's deliberate. There is very poor transparency, but this is, you know, based on what sources we do have. And value added, that's an economic wonkish term. So it's, you know, the difference between the value of the inputs that an industry gets in terms of what it buys from its suppliers and what it, uh, and what it produces out in, uh, in, its, in its revenue, about 10 billion a year. And that's the thing that you can most directly compare to GDP. And that value added comes to less than half a percent of UK GDP. And that employment figure is about a third of 1% of total UK employment. So again, the arms industry does not have influence because it is so big. It, because it is just such a crucial employer. Of course, it is in Barrow and Furness and a few other places, but generally speaking, it is not the foundation of the UK economy. It is not even the foundation of UK manufacturing industry, decimated as that was by Thatcher. Uh, it's still a pretty small proportion of UK manufacturing. It is because of its strategic role. And here's a list of some of the biggest companies. Um, I'm not going to go through all that. Uh, so many of these com arms companies are multinational. Like BAE, that figure for UK employees, 39,000, that's less than half of its employees worldwide. Um, and on the other hand, you've got companies like Leonardo and Thales and Raytheon, Boeing and General Dynamics, which are foreign companies, French, Italian, US, but which have substantial UK arms and have become very important parts of the UK arms industry. Um, so some of these names, if you read the reports, are ones that are going to come up again and again in terms of uh, their closeness to government. So that, that's who the industry is. Now, what about how they influence government, the different channels of influence? The first thing that one might think of, if you're, an, if you're a company and you want to get some good contracts or get some legislation made in your favour, what do you do? You make a big donation to the governing party, uh, to the Tories or Labour or whoever's in government, or maybe both just to hedge your bets. It's not what happens. The arms industry doesn't do that. I went through the list of um, the Electoral Commission's database for arms company donations or rich individuals with connections to the arms industry, virtually nothing, one or two cases, but that's not how the arms industry influences government. So you can forget about that idea of that, you know, the checkbook and the lobbyists coming into the office with a checkbook. Um, it is a very important means of influence for the arms industry in the US. But I think in some ways this is a reflection of the fact that they don't need to do that, that they have the relationships established. Um, but there may be other factors going on, but um, probably best not to dwell on the dogs that don't bark. One of the dogs that definitely does bark is the revolving door. So this is people, and again, it's not limited to the arms industry, going from a position in government to a position in a company uh, working with the department that they were in while they were in government. And in the case of the arms industry, we're talking about uh, both ministers, senior civil servants, and uh, senior military officers, generals and admirals. Now, how does it help the arms industry to have this revolving door? And there's a lot of it. So it might be information. You get inside information through getting these high level revolvers. You get contacts, you know, they are good people, if not to lobby directly the people they used to work with, because that's considered cheating, although no one gets punished for it if they do, um, but at any rate to uh, set up the connections. Incentives. If, and this is certainly the case in the US, and I think to a large extent in the UK, if generals and admirals and top civil servants know that probably their next employer is going to be in the arms industry, then that affects how 
they are going to set policy, how they are going to negotiate with their possible future employers. Occasionally, it can be very direct. There's been cases in the US, for example, where uh, officials have um, been negotiating a contract with a company while separately negotiating a job with that company. And at least one case, they went to prison for that. Um, but usually they don't need to. It's just the fact that they know that this is where their bread is going to be buttered in the future. And finally, culture and ideology. I would say that if you've got so many people going from one to the other, and it goes in the other direction as well, you're getting a community of interest a sense that this is all one team, and that's increasingly the way that the government has talked about policy. It's not customer and supplier anymore, it's partners, or even as one paper recently said, government paper, new, a new alliance with industry. Um, it's the same people, and so this helps create this sense of groupthink, create this idea that the interests of the two are the same, even though they are patently not as the interest of the industry is, as always, its shareholders. So the revolving door happens in lots of places, but it seems to happen three times as much with the arms industry when it comes to pe recruiting people from relevant government departments, mostly the MOD, but not entirely. And I looked through lists of top officials and generals and admirals who left the MOD over a, a, a period of a little over 10 years. 42 of these top officials, after they left government service, ended up with the arms or security industry. And that included a clear majority of those working in procurement roles. And that's the roles where they're working most closely with industry, negotiating with industry on the contracts and following up the programmes as they progress or sometimes fail to progress. So I think that the revolving door, that is clearly a very significant channel of interest in influence. But I think the other channel is very much the access, the institutional access the industry has. There are dedicated government industry forums that meet monthly with ministers and chief executives and so forth. Um, and then if you just look at the regular meetings between the companies and the ministers, oh, I, I've got a list of some of the high profile uh, recent revolvers. I, 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 I'm going to skip over these. You can take a quick look as I click through um, just some recent examples of some very, very high profile people like Mark Sedwell, who was the national security advisor to the prime minister and then went to be a non-executive director for BAE Systems. Um, so um, we, we have a, a, a database of meetings between uh, arms industry people and both ministers and top MOD and Department for Business and Trade officials. And I worked out, looking at the period where we have most complete data, it depends on FOIs, which can be a, a hit and miss affair, that these companies were meeting with the government on average 1.64 times a day. So um, it, it's just a constant flow. So why do you need special contacts to get access? In a sense, you don't. You've got that access already. Don't other um, industries do this? Well, looking just at ministerial meetings, for which there's public data, I went through a Transparency International database and pulling all the different bits and pieces together. And if we look at one-to-one -one company meeting or organisational meetings with ministers over a 12-year period, who had the most? Well, first, it's the Confederation for British Industry. That's not a company. It's representing all of private industry. Then the Local Government Association, representing all the local authorities in the United Kingdom. The first company you come to is BAE Systems, and the second is another company, Airbus. Um, so in this list... Uh, the red ones are the arms companies and the orange ones are the other single individual companies rather than these federations and representative bodies. 
And here's prime ministers. You can understand why arms companies need to meet with the Minister of Defence or the Minister of Defence Procurement. Um, but the prime minister, well, yeah, BAE Systems, top of the list, and Rolls-Royce and Airbus high up there. This is specifically individual companies that met with prime ministers between 2012 and 2023. And those non-arms companies in blue, big, powerful companies, all of them much bigger than BAE Systems, but they don't get to meet the Prime Minister as often as BAE Systems. In fact, BAE, last time I looked, was only the 15th largest company on the stock market by market capitalisation. So when you see these figures, you get an idea of just how closely embedded the industry is with government. And this was why uh, we came up with this title of the Open Plan Office. That if you look at someone like Mark Sedwill, the National Security Advisor, Cabinet Se Secretary, going to BAE, it's not so much a revolving door going from one organisation to another. He's just moving to a different part of the office. The office is the National Security State. And from their point of view, this is not a scandal. This is not a conflict of interest. It's entirely natural for someone who's working on national security for the government to go and work on national security in a different capacity for a private company. And so this is why it seems to me that the line between government and industry has not only been blurred, in the case of BAE, it's been erased. And if you look at recommendations, I mean, it's hard to come up with recommendations for something so deeply entrenched. But one of the ones we've put, I've put in there is break up BAE systems. They control two, even if you're looking for, from the narrow military point of view of how can we get the best kit for our troops. Having one company responsible for a half a dozen different areas of um, production with no other British alternative is not really the best way to do that. And also, hopefully, it would help break BAE's stranglehold on policy on arms exports as well. So I will finish there. I've probably gone on too long and pass over to our other wonderful panellists. Just a quick reminder, we have uh, over 100 people on our online forum. So please, please, please make sure to send your questions on the Q&A rather than the chat. And I will pass now to Nico Edwards. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, B. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you and in the company of such a distinguished panel. Um, as B said, I'm Nico Edwards, and I'm a researcher and organizer in all things militarism, arms trade, climate, and social justice. And I'm just going to begin with saying how incredibly valuable I find this research to be, and I'm so grateful that it's out in the world, because I started citing it a long, a long time ago before I even saw the report, and now I'm very happy to keep doing so in a more formal fashion. Uh, I'm going to speak to today's key themes more from the perspective of personal experience. So rather than speaking sort of to the facts uh, of how these things really function or the rigor of the report, uh, I can give you a sense of how military industry actors or the salesmen of war, if you like, themselves perceive, communicate about, and relate to this relationship between industry and, gov industry and government. And I'm heading into my third year of PhD studies at the University of Sussex, and as part of these studies over the past 12 months, I've attended a fair uh, amount of large-scale, globally relevant military trade shows, or the stuff that we're normally, um, we, we're used to calling arms fairs. And each show is no longer than four or five days, uh, but I assure you that during this time, you'll get a great insight into the workings of defense policy, or what we might call war profiteering, and uh, the motivations of defense men. Uh, especially, sadly, if you play your very best uh, girl who knows how to hang out with the boys part. So the, the time that I've spent with, uh, in this context and the people that I've come close to as interlocutors, speak directly to Sam's findings in different ways. And I'll share with you two of these two key dimensions of my encounters with this, these military businessmen, uh, if you like. 
And firstly, and perhaps the most, to me, the most obvious and palpable dimension, even though Sam says that money is not the key factor maybe driving this influence, but to, as an object of desire, I see it in, in sort of inf, inf, um, impacting and influencing all of these dimensions. So, so there's money as a type of influence or a material power operating in this space, but also as a social force, as a point of reference through which to order the social relations that make up this national security state. And looking at the making of defense policy from the perspective uh, of, of military trade shows, you notice very quickly that money or the generation and protection of wealth is the key factor driving both the movement of people across the defense sector and enabling or shaping the ideas that gain currency in this space as well, even though they are highly ineffective on the battlefield and as a military strategy. So ideas that make economic growth or the protection of British uh, economic interests abroad by military means that make these appear as rational, as a rational premise for practicing what we call peace, security, and foreign policy, right? And as several arms salesmen have told me, quote, it's all about the money. Uh, indeed, <laughs> in my latest conversations with, with uh, some of these inter in insiders at a trade show in Poland just two weeks ago, they affirmed the extent to which this profit motive drives the sector, right? And both the industry and the government side of things in various ways. So let's look at some. Um, one interlocutor told me a story about this TV show that he used to watch as a kid, where the protagonist proceeds to burn a $100 bill, and he holds it up to the camera and says, only a billionaire can do this. And my interlocutor says that that's exactly what the military industry feels like to him. A whole sector aspiring to become this one man who can burn a $100 bill for show. And so for instance, this uh, is expressed in this space as when to gain credibility in the mil military trade show, um, which supposedly is a space dedicated to peace and security and defense, right? You need to put your wealth on display and your personal wealth and the wealth of the company and, and your access to different actors. Or what the interlocutor also refers to as military industrial peacocking. Uh, and similarly, when I asked a group of military technology salesmen and a, an army major working for the US Department of Defense, in part for procurement, uh, I asked them if they come across a lot of people in this space that are uh, literally in it for the money. And they all, just went silent and started smiling and nodded. And the message was something along the lines of a majority. Um, another interlocutor confirmed this proximity between government and arms producers as indeed rooted in issues of capital and its maximization. And, and here I quote him at length, industry does not exist without grants. Industry gets grants, tax breaks, land, relaxation of land use restrictions, certi certification shortcuts, all the things that increase profits. Industry generates, prof generates profit and government gets the vote. Somehow he sees that relationship. Not to mention a lucrative position on the board of those uh, they gave contracts to, to when there's a change in government. Uh, and they no longer have their cushy government job. Just like Mr. Pine. Uh, he is the norm, not the exception. And here he, he refers to Mr. Pine as, as the Christopher Pine, a former Australian uh, defense and defense in industry minister who's just gone on to become uh, the advisory board chairman of Australia's largest munitions manufacturing company. And as a final anecdote on money, um, this might be in the report, but I haven't read the whole report, so we'll see. Uh, there's a unit at the UK Defence and Security Exports Department that employs active serving members of the British Armed Forces for two year cycles, during which they join uh, the Ministry of Defence to literally facilitate UK military exports. So these troops, uh, one of whom I met in Poland, attend trade shows and sit in on ministry industry meetings and utilize their position um, as in the forces to meet new potential customers anywhere in the world. To quote unquote, boost exports for UK defense companies and generate revenue for the British state wherever we can. And this example to me illustrates 
so neatly the extent to which profit motives from arms sales have become equated with ensuring British national security, right? However weird that sounds to us in the room. And how even the people who are tasked with physically keeping our society and protecting the nation with their bodies and minds, even they become drawn into or they become puppets for military industrial expansion, right? They've been told that their mission, even as soldiers, is to protect and promote British prosperity, quote unquote. And it turns out that this prosperity um, means capital ac accumulation for the few. And I think there's something interesting to tease out here, which is exactly the point that Sam made as well. Because for the defense sector men themselves, and whichever part of them you engage, industry, finance, armed forces, uh, government, the fact that security is for export, right? That the premise of national defense and global stability are predicated upon growing the economy of weapons production and military infrastructures. That's not a bad thing to the insiders. That's, it's rather normal and even preferred. So how do we critique and problematize this logic if there is no strength in, in our so-called um, shock factor or the shock value in, in our exposing um, of this underlying profit motive, because this is something we like to do as researchers and activists. We like to expose the fact that this is the, under, the underlying logic, and they're like, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not news to anyone. Um, and I think this means that we need to find other much deeper uh, <coughs> arguments for why the system is broken. And for why a security policy based on military industrial growth and a ceaseless development and trade of technologies of violence does not work. Um, or rather only creates security for certain actors and certain values at the expense of uh, the rest of planet Earth. So uh, to my second di uh, dimension, I'd just like to highlight what perhaps are two pieces of the puzzle that go unanswered in the report, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. And these pieces represent, I think, one way of looking deeper, uh, looking for a deeper argument for why the system is broken. And they regard uh, the role of gender and non-material forms of power in shaping and enabling the channels of influence between arms industry, armed forces, and government. And though they're, they're not made explicit, but we see both gender and alternative powers operate throughout the sections covered in the report, throughout the forms of influence. Because besides money as a de facto material form of power or an object of desire, um, there are other forms of influence and socializing processes that are extremely palpable in, in shaping and making up the military industrial complex. And, and as per my own experiences, an especially palpable such force, a uh, socializing force, is toxic masculinity. And the way chauvinism, pure and simple, lends itself to martial forms of realism, meaning how deeply harmful norms around macho masculinities feed into and normalize a capital-hungry capital militarist mindsets and rationalities and desires and behaviors, and by extension, how they help promote and normalize militarist policy agendas and budget, budget priorities. And in these trade shows, but also outside of, outside of them and through my interlocutors, I've become witness to over and over again the extreme effectiveness of how, of how men in the military industrial complex or the national security state, whatever term we use, and they make up 99.9% of this space, how they force each other to fall in line with the militarist wealth-driven type toxic masculinity, obsessed with ordering each other according to alphas, betas, and the irrelevance. And all of these categories are, are vo woven into um, ideas and ideals around business or salesmen on the one hand, and military men or soldiers are on the other. And that's a, it's an intriguing sort of dynamic to see play out in that space. And seeing the different um, military and industrial complex men Navigate this social train uh, is frankly both fascinating and terrifying, uh, especially when you become a pawn in that performance. So to a final point, I know I'm maybe short on time. I think if we're truly interested uh, in understanding how and why a broken defense industrial system just keeps on going, 
and for certain accent actors it's not broken, we need to also have a proper look at the powers of this type of social coding. And two interesting questions that surface to me here then is, firstly, how do we understand different types of power operating in the context of arms industry and government relations? Not only the material power of the military industrial complex or the political power of policy makers, but also underlying social forms of power, such as indeed gender or capitalist and martial realisms and their cognitive straight holds, right? Like their, their hold over our mentalities. And secondly, where does toxic masculinity fit in, right? As a category of influence in its own right, um, or as a norm or force operating through the various channels and influences. And interrogating these ideals of hyper-masculinity or macho displays of wealth, dominance and force is fundamental to upsetting, I think, the processes by which it becomes normal to premise national security and foreign policy even on weapons production and trade and military industrial growth. And as two different interlocutor interlocutors told me using the same wor words, we all just want to shoot things or blow, th or blow them up. A statement that uh, was meant to make explicit, I think, the obsession with the use of uh, both kinetic and sexual force, right? And so finally, to conclude with a quote that I think really brings home the extent to which um, fantasies around wealth, force, and sex come together in this military industrial complex, and it's a quote that also underscores Sam's conclusion that we're no longer talking about a revolving door type relationship uh, between arms industry and government, but rather an open office plan. And I, I asked my main interlocutor, a senior man from a Western context um, with decades of defense industry experience, what he thinks of this issue. And he said, incest. Hmm. Incest is the word that best describes this relationship. Thank you. I clearly should have put incest in the report title. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't need anything added on to that title. So. <laughs> Dan, would you like to give us your thoughts on Sam's report? We really love your insights. Uh, fascinating report, Sam, um, and a fascinating talk just now. Um, I, I'll just, uh, I think it's sort of the dark irony this week I was. Um, calling up a contact, somebody who was Grant Shapps' special advisor, trying to find out something relating to decisions that were taken in government in Grant's era and a bit of background and find out some things I shouldn't know. And he told me, I've got a new job. I said, oh, what's that? Because I'm working for Linton Crosby. I thought, fuck me. <laughs> he said, yeah, I've just, start, I've just started. It's my second day. And I thought, mm, the election wasn't that long ago. Mm, only a few months, I suppose it's, I don't know. Is it all right? Maybe I should look it up. Who else is there, he said. Who else? Is, is someone else here? Is it oh, who? Sam's already mentioned it in passing. Mark Carlton Smith, who's the head of the British Army, who went to school, of course, with Boris Johnson. Indeed, was thought nearly a candidate, or nearly a successful candidate to be chief of the defence staff. And you think to yourself, well, it's a small world, isn't it? And I suspect, and that's already been touched on, that uh, once you make the next sort of set of phone calls in a few months' time, or the next person leaves government, it's a remarkable how fast they end up in, in these arms industries, and remarkable how uh, willing the various sort of regulatory bodies are to sort of uh, shrug these things off or, 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 or not complain about them. But I sort of, I kind of, the way I see the arms industry, I mean, people have talked about incest, which I guess is a memorable way of thinking about it, or open plan office. Um, I just see the arms industry as sort of functionally merged to the power of the state. And when I was a different kind of journalist, a sort of financial journalist, I'd occasionally report on the affairs of companies and see them as rather powerful. Curiously, which might surprise you, it might not, I rarely, very rarely, in my current job, defense editor, the defense editor of the Guardian, I very rarely deal with arms companies because I don't need to, because they won't talk to me. And the reason they won't talk to me is they're not allowed to talk to me. And the reason they're not allowed to talk to me is I have to talk to the Ministry of Defense or I have to talk to Downing Street because they're all part of the state. So if we could start with a sort of sequence, if we could start with a sequence of examples and then each one kind of cascades and reinforces the other. And what you see is a world really in which what the arms industry is doing is it's sort of reinforcing diplomatic relationships, the power of the British state, uh, uh, and, you know, vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And, and a British arms success is as much a diplomatic success or maybe an economic success. I know you critique some of that, Sam, but, or something else. So, of course, for a long time, and of course it still goes on, but we don't talk about it quite so much because the war in Yemen is not in as intense as it was. But 
the arms relationship between uh, uh, British aerospace and BAE in Saudi Arabia was seen as fundamental and strategic importance to the British state. It still is. And of course, there was a long, there was a long and dismal period of, of, of Saudi bombing in Yemen. And, and because it was a British company that, whose pave way missiles or, 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 or jets that maybe have been involved in some of that bombing, then some of those complaints and concerns would come back to the Foreign Office to discuss and look at. And Philip Hammond, when he was Foreign Secretary, and Boris Johnson, when they were Foreign Secretary, would sit around and have these agonised meetings in which it was discovered that the Saudis had you know, bombed, a, you know, bombed some civilians in Yemen, it probably or likely or to use British weapons, and everyone had to consider once again whether it was right to carry on granting export licences. And, of course, the answer to the question was always, yes, it was, uh, or apart from a brief hiatus from a successful challenge from CAT. But the point is here that British ministers and their aides um, in the Foreign Office, in trade, in, in the MOD, but principally the Foreign Office, would sit around and discuss again and again every time there was a major sort of airstrike in Yemen involving civilian casualties, because, you know, involving BAE weapons, because it was ultimately it funneled up to being a political problem. And the political problem was not that the Saudis should stop, that they should be remonstrated with. The political problem was how can we continue to get away with it and how can we get to the point that it's okay? And then under Boris Johnson, who mostly was Prime Minister for not very long, you know, again, we had a kind of reinforcement this idea. And at this point, we sort of had a period where perhaps the war on terror had ended and, the, uh, and some sort of nebulous era of state competition was around the corner. And we saw this sort of principal agreement struck, again, an arms deal done between Boris Johnson, Joe Biden, and then, then Scott Morrison, then the Prime Minister of Australia, the AUKUS submarine agreement. And here you see a sort of tripartite agreement in which the Americans generously allowed, uh, have generously allowed the Brits to try and build these new AUKUS nuclear submarines um, for Australia, which will become for Britain and for Australia, initially at Barrow and then in Australia, thereby keeping the BAE shipyard alive and well into business in the 2040s. But, and, and a proliferation of nuclear technology, okay, not nuclear arms, but nuclear propulsion to a country... Australia that's not had it before, and in which Australia becomes the first country in the world to have nuclear propulsion available to it without nuclear arms. And this is a kind of deal that consumed the energies of these three principles. You know, uh, Scott Morrison went to, went to Boris Johnson to lobby him, then went to Biden, and they went to Biden together, and Biden in a, said at the time, oh, it's fine for the Australians to have it. Why? Because they're Australia. Um, so you get this technology transfer, these commitments for 20-odd years all around nuclear propulsion, nuclear technology. And what's it all for? Perhaps to help the Americans nebulously to sort of deal with some threat from China. Now, I'm not a big fan of authoritarian China, but I also know it's a long way away. Uh, 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 you know, and there was a phase here in under Johnson, the policy was post-geographic. In other words, the further a country away was away from us, the more important it was, the nearer it was like Europe, the less so. But what was more important of all, one that triumphs this period, supposedly, was this AUKUS relationship. Again, an arms deal led by leaders, and somewhere down the trail of it are these companies, BAE in particular, and others, but they're kind of not really not, not almost not relevant because the arms industry has functionally merged. Now, some of this discussion has really been clear in the war in Ukraine. Now, I support Ukraine's right to defend itself, for sure, against the, against the Russian invaders, but... What you also see in these discussions about weapons types, most notably and currently Storm Shadow, is how clear, again, each weapons type, it's made in a country, it's therefore a decision of the country and its leaders whether the weapons type can be used, in this case, inside Russia or not. Now, Storm Shadow is made by MBDA. It's an Anglo-French-Italian consideration. Of course, the French have a different name for the missiles. They call them Scout. That's their business. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So you've already got three governments who have to approve whether this arms, whether this... Uh, whether, whether the Ukrainians can use them to bomb inside Russia. And then Keir Starmer last, last week goes to, you know, goes to the White House to have a discussion with Joe Biden about it. And we think America makes components for Storm Shadow, and that's one of the ways it has some leverage. And America has to, you know, the United States has to approve it, or it provides some targeting, and, and t targeting technology that Storm Shadow needs. Or you just, well, you don't want to upset the Americans by doing something that Joe Biden doesn't want you to do, because well, we're all in the war together, or really, because America's the most powerful military nation on Earth, and no British Prime Minister's going to want to upset them. 
So again, you have this discussion about arms, which is not done at a corporate level. It's done at the level of prime ministers, foreign secretaries and defence secretaries. Mm -hmm. Because the arms trade just comes... The arms trade, again, is a sort of provincial department, well, or a small department in the empire of, in the, empire of the state. And that takes you, I guess, to some of the, uh, the absurdities in the decision by David Lammy to restrict some arms sales to Israel but not others, better than nothing perhaps, but nevertheless, you saw this essential point, which is F-35 sales remained exempt. Essentially, uh, it may be or may not be complicated to untangle, but essentially to keep the, Ameri essentially to keep the US happy, to keep the Lockheed Martin train going, you know, the Lockheed Martin train going. And in fact, Sam and I discussed it, can't get to the bottom of it, uh, 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 you know, there's a question about what it, what it, what in the government-to-government -government deal that accompanies these things between Britain and the U.S. You know, has Britain promised the U.S. that we will always, all, our guys will always make the components for F-35, come what, come what may, you know, whoever the end customer that the U.S. Congress happens to happens to approve. <coughs> so you again, you have all these relationships, all taken, all these decisions taken at the most senior level that cascade down and only rather incidentally you end up discussing the arms companies. Now what's interesting I think is that uh, Labour's obviously going to have its own defence review, uh, fair enough, uh, uh, but from the early mood music it's quite clear that the arms industry, um, uh, they want to take a positive relationship with the arms industry, arguing that it's a lot to do with the protection of jobs. Uh, uh, or, 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 or the development of jobs. Now, again, Sam's done a sort of cri critique of that earlier, but those arguments about jobs, we all know, are very strong and powerful in government. You know, the main reason that Gordon Brown chose to build two aircraft carriers when arguably one would have done, and there was a quite a good proposal, if you're into aircraft carriers at all, to share, to alternate with the French. But anyway, the reason that two were built was essentially to say was to preserve jobs in the dockyard in in, in the dockyards on, 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 on the Clyde and the Forth. And Labour was rewarded by about ten plus years of SNP dominance uh, in Scotland for its trouble. But nevertheless, that was the driving that was the that was the fundamental driving factor in the decision. And you can decide or or or, 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 or there's a discussion here about whether that's worth it or you want to deindustrialise and so on. But these are the kind of things the drive the thinking in government, the, the, the drive the thinking in government, and will drive the thinking in this Labour government and this defence review. You could see that in part in the appointment of uh, Fiona Hill as an advisor, very smart, clever kind of woman in many ways, but also someone who's very focused on industrial gener regeneration. Uh, uh, from her, you know, having had the particular experience she had in her native northeast, and 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 when she, you know, she said there's nothing. Her dad said to her, "There's nothing for you here," and she went to America and made her name, career in career in America. So you'll. I think you're going to so you're going to see this kind of strategic thinking that we need to we need to develop the arms trade because it gives us jobs because it gives us power and influence in the world and it gives us relationships and we can have a relationship with Saudi Arabia because we can give them BAE kit and if we don't the French will send the Raphael will sell the Raphael jets and we lose that relationship we have lo we have we are in the conversation in Ukraine because we can supply certain types of arms we have to not upset the Americans by Sticking in, sticking in the game in the F-35s, even though we know, uh, even though we know with reality what's happening in Gaza, but we commit heroic circumlocutions in order to uh, avoid this. And I think the interesting question for me, finally, and I think the, in a way, the British public see through all this uh, great power politics, and or they do in some ways. And I'm always struck by, despite all these discussions about arms sales, government to government relationships. Interesting, great power politics. You'd like to write about that sort of thing. But at the same time, you have a kind of crisis in recruitment in the British Army, or in all the armed forces, actually. You really struggle. Or, or, all the forces are struggling to recruit people. And wh why, why is this? Well, there's bad pay. That, that doesn't help. But also, what's the mission? What's the purpose? Are we, you know, and, and you think about the last set of war, you know, the last wars that Britain have fought in Iraq and Afghanistan, distinctly, un, you know, uh, uh, not on a clear prospectus, with an unclear end, with an uncertain, un, un, unsuccessful ending, um, uh, 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 you know, atro you know, atrocities committed, for example, in in, in Afga war crimes in Afghanistan, um, uh, all quite problematic interventions. Who wants to be part? of What young person wants to be part of that? How aspirational is that? And there isn't really. Well, what there isn't is a kind of effort to sort of rethink and go. We're a country that isn't much threatened, despite everything that's going on in Ukraine. 
out. We're, we're a country that isn't much threatened by nasty neighbours. Um, so what's the purpose of a modern military in, the, in this kind of context? Uh, and I think that that's why you need to start thinking about a modern military that people want, maybe it's a modern military that can engage with, can you can start engaging with environmental problems or helping with flooding or, crisis, or, or, or particular forms of crisis or something that might make it more attractive and more, more, more relevant. And if we are in a world where countries like Ukraine do need some help, well, maybe there's a, then maybe we can then, then there's a discussion you can have about that. I think that's a slightly different. I think it's a slightly different discussion. But you need to think about reframing these, because for ordinary people, these discussions about power and politics they're interesting to follow, but they don't seem to mean very much their life. Very much their lives. So for me, as I say. These, it's not, uh, you know, other, everyone's used their own expression, open plan office and, 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 and incest. You know, mine is much simpler. I, I just simply see the arms trade as an appendage of government, that they are functionally merged with the British state and its interests. And, uh, uh, and, and so almost, you know, the companies themselves have a large they are and appear to be uh, kind of almost a rounding, you know, you know, a rounding error in people's thinking. These are games played by politicians and they might be fun to watch. But they're not, they're not games for us to be part of. Hmm. Thank you. First of all, thanks, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, it's wonderful to be on such a great panel, transnational, transatlantic panel but also with three such wise people. I feel I'm probably um, the odd one out here in many ways. It's also great, Dan, if I could just say, to have a journalist working in the commercial media taking such an interest in, in this area, but in a, in a critical and intelligent way. We haven't always had that in the 23 years that I've been doing this work, so it, it really is great. It was, it was really good to hear your input. Um, of course, huge congratulations to everyone involved in the report. Um, I think it is a brilliant report. It is crucially important to where we are as a country at the moment. And it's not only crucially important because of our role across the world, it's crucially important for Britain and our democracy as well. And I particularly have to congratulate whoever came up with the short title, not the long version, but just the short title. Although I think, Nico, um, your even shorter version might just eclipse it. But I really do think that, that language is very important and we need to change the language of how we talk about this industry and its relationship to government. Is it simply a part of government, an appendage of government? And I want to make a comment on that in a moment. Um, because this is very important for us as taxpayers, for us as citizens. But before sharing a few thoughts on that, I think it's incredibly important that we do not forget the context that CAT published this report in. This country and its arms companies aren't just complicit in a genocide, a genocide that we watch every day on our screens, a genocide the manner of which I never imagined I would see in my lifetime. We are not just complicit in it, but for many of the reasons that the report outlines, we are profiting from it. What does it say about a nation, about companies, when they are profiting from the sort of brutality and slaughter that we see every day. When we and our allies, the United States of America and a number of Western European countries, actually have it in our hands to bring it to a stop. A couple of weeks ago, 
reading an FT headline that euphorically estimated that the defense companies around the world are about to benefit from a 52 billion pound bonanza over the coming 18 to 24 months with not a mention of the human consequences of those earnings. So in many ways, I agree with Dan that these companies are just an, appended, an appendage of the state. They are mechanisms through which we carry out various aspects of foreign and defense and national security policy. But it does go beyond that in ways that I'll mention in a moment. But we must remember that the vast, vast majority, if not all, of these appendages of the state are privately listed companies. I have a huge pile, thanks to Kat, actually, who when I first arrived in this country and within weeks of arriving in this country, one of the Kat staff members at the time, Anne Feltham, had somehow discovered how to contact me, had pinned me down to a meeting and had ensured that I became a shareholder in BAE Systems so that I could attend the AGM every year. So I have this stack of dividend checks from BAE Systems, which I obviously haven't cashed and which I'm trying to persuade an artist who does a lot of work on defense-related topics to make an artwork from. And because these are amongst the most subsidized companies in our countries, because they are appendages of the state, if we look at the role of defense attaches in our embassies around the world in marketing these companies, because they are, as Dan says, completely intertwined with our foreign policy, our foreign relations, if we look at the sort of investments in their R&D, This is basically taking public money, our money, but turning it into private profit. So I agree with Dan, they are appendages of the state. And while I understand that from a policy dimension, from an economic dimension, it is inexcusable because it's simply a transfer of our money into hands that many of us don't want it to go into. And I should just mention something about the jobs discussion at this point, which the report outlined so graphically. But there is also a very important study that was done, in fact, three studies that were done by various institutions and individuals in the United States over a period of years, all of which estimated broadly that for the cost of each defense job, one could create between three and seven equivalent jobs in far more socially and as importantly, economic, economically productive sectors. But we continue to hear this jobs argument. We continue to see our politicians peddle this argument with this everything in our political discourse these days, absolutely no nuance, absolutely no engagement with the reality of the nonsense that is spewed to ensure that the status quo remains as it is. Now, as some of you who I've worked with for a long time know, I spent 23 years working on corruption in this sector because I saw my own country four years into our nascent democracy, totally corrupted by this industry. And Dan, if you think that the United Kingdom doesn't really have a need for the extent of the defense industry we have, try South Africa with Nelson Mandela as president. And this was at a time when we had six million people living with HIV or AIDS, 
but our president Thabo Mbeki told us we didn't have the money to provide antiretrovirals to keep people alive. Instead, we spent $10 billion on weapons we never needed and we've never used. Why? Because a minimum of $350 million of bribes were paid. And the extraordinary thing is when I wrote my first book, I thought that we were just stupid, that we were just naive because none of us expected to be in government. We were just activists. And then as I started researching more, moving from the one book to the shadow world, I realized that what had happened to us in South Africa is happening all over the world. And that our politicians are entirely, entirely complicit in the system of corruption. And this industry is so systemically corrupt that we in Shadow World Investigations use a term that the anti-corruption world tends to use for a certain type of corruption. We use the phrase state capture, which is when the key institutions of state, including the highest officers of state, have been captured for private interests. And the, those private interests and the public interests of the institutions of state are indistinguishable. And the South African arms deal was obviously the precursor to perhaps the most notorious version of state capture, which was the administration, although to call it that is a horrible misuse of the word, the administration of Jacob Zuma, who in his eight years in office, he and his business associates stole one third of the country's GDP every year for those eight years to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. In the United States, as, as Sam hinted, the system that exists, the payment of money to the defense companies, is what I describe in the shadow world as a form of legalized bribery. And that's not a term that I came up with. It was a term that someone on Capitol Hill suggested to me, a longtime researcher for Congress's defense committees. In the UK, I think, Sam, you're probably quite correct in the report to say that direct money from the defense companies and those most directly involved with them doesn't actually amount to much. But what we also have to look at, and this is a methodological question, is first of all, how much money comes through the intermediaries into the political system? And when I say intermediaries, I'm not just talking about the sort of arms dealers who are the caricatures in Hollywood films. I'm talking about the banks, the consulting firms, the auditing firms, the law firms, who make huge amounts of money out of all of these transactions. There was an arms dealer who, only because I don't want to go to prison for libel, whose name I won't mention, a pillar of the British establishment who after one of the most corrupt commercial transactions in history told me in an indiscreet conversation that he couldn't remember exactly how many people he'd given significant amounts of money to to make donations to the Tory party at that point. He thought it was somewhere around 120 individuals, but he wasn't sure. The only two who we know about are his wife and daughter but there were 120 at least others. So I think we need to look at that sort of way in which the industry finances our politics even more indirectly than we perhaps imagine. So the revolving door is over. So I want to talk about the open plan office. And Sam identified this in the report, and the richness of this work is extraordinarily commendable, and we've needed this update and this work for a very long time in Britain. And we now have a responsibility to figure out how we're going to ensure that this sort of information and material gets the widest audience possible, because it speaks so directly to the nature of our democracy. And I would argue that not only in my own country, South Africa, but in Britain today, in the United States of America, and sadly, many countries of Western Europe, we have the best democracies money can buy. 
So this work is absolutely central to how we renew and reinvigorate our own democracies. The jobs and money that goes to politicians, military and intelligence leaders once they leave office, as Sam has documented in the report, the importance of this cannot be overestimated. Jacob Zuma is a very corrupt man who has made millions, if not billions of dollars out of the South African state while 37% of his citizens who he was supposed to serve are unemployed. While over two and a half million people don't have a roof over their head. But so too are all of those politicians, all of those military leaders, all of those bureaucrats who go straight into these defense companies as we've seen. Because if you are telling me that the knowledge that they have this profitable retirement after their primary career does not influence their decision making in office, I refer you to the myriad American military officials, politicians, and bureaucrats who have served proudly on the boards of their defense companies, talking quite explicitly, and there are some of them in the Shadow World film, some of them in the book, about how this was at the forefront of their minds while they were making decisions in office. And, you know, I can't help myself but mention Tony Blair, who's wonderful. He had a, I can't remember what it was called now, Project on Africa, but it had a, a more formal title than that, in which he had all sorts of incredibly intelligent people, including my then boss in South Africa, Trevor Manuel, our finance minister, getting together for months and months and months to determine what Africa needed. And of course what Africa needed was less corruption and better governance. And Blair very proudly announced the findings of this report at exactly the same time he was in South Africa negotiating the bribes that BAE Systems paid to at least three of the six members of our cabinet who made the decisions about what weaponry we were going to buy and from who. And this is the same man who, after leaving office, has made tens, if not hundreds, of millions of pounds personally from the companies that benefited from our involvement in the invasion of Iraq and from his association with British and American arms companies, primarily BAE Systems. He and Sir Richard Evans, former executive chair of BAE Systems, have acted as consultants for most of the world's most despotic regimes. What did they actually do for that money? Well, in most cases, absolutely nothing. This was payment for what they did while they were in their respective offices, in the prime minister's office and as executive chairman of a company that in the words of former foreign secretary Robin Cook, has the key to the back door of 10 Downing Street. Crucial to understand what this does to our democracies, to our societies, to the world, are not just these decisions that are made while these people are in office, but the reality that more pervasively it ensures that our governments, our politicians, perceive the world through what C. Wright Mills describes as a militarist mindset. The lens through which we view the world, that everything can be resolved by conflict and war, be it the war on drugs, the war on sugar, the war on cheating in sport. As Claire Short once suggested, and I think repeated in the Shadow World film, why don't we just declare war on wars? And this impacts not just our defense and national security policy, but it impacts every aspect of government policy, but also 
the way in which we engage with the world. And Nico's experience, putting herself in that situation, a situation where I, as a white male, spent many years before I published and I wasn't allowed into any of these things, where, you know, it's assumed I'm one of the boys, is incredibly important to understand the impact this has on the way in our societies we conceive of gender and gender relations. Because most of the time, I think, for goodness sake, do people actually think we're living in some shitty Hollywood film where testosterone levels have gone through the roof, where the United States Navy deploys an aircraft carrier and two frigates to disarm a ship that has been taken by two emaciated pirates from Somalia, each with a rusty AK-47 in their hands. See the film Mr. Phillips to see the absurdity of America's military industrial complex. And by the way, for anybody, a few people who are sort of of my vintage, who might have seen the film, Captain Phillips himself, according to the crew, when I did some research after ask, being asked to write a review of the film by the producers, the crew described the fact that the first thing that Captain Phillips did when the two pirates went aboard the ship was to lock himself into a cupboard. And he's the hero of this film. The reality is it impacts everything. It impacts our economic and financial policies. I'm about to finish, B. <laughs> I, like Dan, I don't begrudge the billions that we are now sending to Ukraine because I too believe that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was illegal and that's incredibly important that Ukrainian civilians have an ability to be defended and defend themselves just like I believe every civilian in Gaza and the occupied Palestinian territories has a right to defend themselves and every civilian in Yemen has a right to be defended. What I do object to is when the amounts we are sending to Ukraine dwarfs what it would cost to scrap the two child benefit cap in Britain, consigning thousands and thousands of children to poverty over the next year or so, dwarfs the amount it would cost to maintain the winter fuel allowance then I do have problems with it, and very serious problems with it. And as someone who worked in government on financing and budgeting, these are the trade-offs that we make. And they are not economic trade-offs. They are political choices, and we need to understand that. And we need to make sure our politicians understand that we understand that. So finally, let me say, and I probably shouldn't be doing this, we have produced a new book and the reason that I'm mentioning the book is that we do have a few copies of it which I'm going to ask one or two of my colleagues if, if anybody would like a copy thanks to Jeremy Corbyn's Peace and Justice Project we can sell it for £10 even though it's supposed to be sold for £12.99 and the reason I'm mentioning this book is not only because my colleague Rona who is sitting here is the reason this book exists and has done such an extraordinary job of it. And, <laughs> and like those who've produced this report, these two interventions are just of such critical importance at this moment in time in the world that we live in. But also because of the title of the book, which is, of, I hadn't seen Bee reaching for her pen, I would have mentioned something about. The title of the book is Monstrous Anger of the Guns. How the global arms trade is ruining the world and what we can do about it. Read what extraordinary activists from all over the world are doing to oppose the impact of the global arms trade in their communities or in their countries. Because despite all of the grim information that this report produces, it is the work of activists like this and the knowledge that there will soon come a tipping point when people realize the BS that our politicians have been selling us for so long. And that gives me a great sense of hope.
Thank you, Sam, and thank you, panelists, for your incredible feedback. So I would like for anybody in the audience who has a question to please just kind of wave it up just in case, because we already have about 14 questions online. Um, but we're only going to do a few. I see a hand over here, too, um, because sadly we're running out of time. Um, Sam? I think we can go over a bit. We have a hard stop in that we need to be out of this place completely at 9.30, but I think otherwise we're... we're I promise, yeah, we will not keep you until 9.30. I have but not slept properly. Okay. We, we can run over so that we can get some good questions. And perfect, perfect. Mm. So, Sam, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions first from the audience. Um, several of our panelists, and you as well, mentioned sort of the relationship between your report and several other countries. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the comparative report that will be coming out later on. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, but the, the report that the, the, the revisions to which I've owed you for several weeks. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have a concept for a plan. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's interesting that, that there are common features. Um, the revolving door is ubiquitous. Um, the na precise nature of the relationship between arms industry and government does vary. Um, in, in the US, it is much more this system of you know, legalized bribery um, that, that they are spending millions with, with, with their checkbox on individual congressmen and women and, um, and presidential candidates. That's partly because um, in the US, Congress sets the budget, um, including the defense budget. The, the, you, you, the president asks for a budget and then Congress decide actually they want more than the president is asking for when it comes to the military. Um, and each Congress person wants to get some more production in their own district um, or some more contracts for the company that's contributed to their campaigns. Um, in Britain, Parliament can vote up or down the budget. So long as the government has a majority, they'll never vote it down. They can't amend the budgets for departments in any significant way. And... Generally speaking, when it comes to something like this, MPs are lobby, fodders, lobby fodder for their party leaders. So there's, there's no point paying individual MPs to try and promote a favoured arms project. It doesn't do anything. Um, whereas in the US, it's a much bigger factor. So I saw quite a lot of differences depending on these political factors and the structure of the arms industry. Like in the UK, BAE is a monopoly on everything, or, or at least a whole load of different areas. In the US, there are a number of companies that produce fighter aircraft or different things. So each of them is going to be wanting to promote their pet projects. I mean, they'll all get fed. The government wants all of them to keep going. But you know, they do have their different interests. So there are different scenes going on. I got the impression in Germany, the, it, you've still got revolving door, you've still got a lot of these things going on, but some of the regulatory measures are a little bit stronger. Um, it's, it's far from a, a, a perfect system or anything like that, but I get the feeling that some of these channels of influence are at least not quite as powerful as, as in most of the others. And th there's other cases like Australia, which wasn't until recently a significant arms producer, where there was a deliberate policy decision they wanted to become one. And that they, in that period, in a short space of time, the arms industry was pulled into this close embrace and got this huge degree of influence that the revolving door suddenly started spinning at an enormous rate. And the arms industry went from being a really pretty minor factor in the Australian picture to really a degree of state capture when, when it comes to defence and a great deal of stuff that is either legalized corruption or possibly actual uh, illegal corruption that is, is actually starting to be investigated. And it's just remarkable how quickly, when the state decided they, we want to be an arms producing 
um, company, country that the industry got rapidly pulled in and promoted to a position of power. So uh, hopefully this report will be out before too long. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think there are some interesting both similarities and differences. Wonderful. I am going to ask a couple of questions with the hope that you'll kind of know who is asking this question <laughs> to which person. Um, so should the arms industry be publicly owned rather than broken up into smaller private units? The next question is, how would you verbalize the effect Palestine action has had on A, Albit, and B, on the government slash Israel? And then the last question is, completely agree with the emphasis of the role of toxic masculinity and the power of this social coding, but how do we change the dialogue on what security is, as so many currently appear to believe in the dialogue that we need more and more arms to be secure? Who wants to go first? Let's go first? to Andrew. Maybe Andrew can speak a little bit about Palestine. Sure. Um, I think it's important to, in answering the question about its impact on government in Israel, we only have to look at the fact that there are a number of Palestine action people in prison um, who are not being allowed access to any sort of communication devices, any sort of research devices, who are effectively political prisoners. And if this was happening in despotic authoritarian states, we would all be outraged by it. Amnesty would have campaigns for them. Today, the co-founder of Palestine Action appeared in court for the first time on charges under the Terrorism Act. Um, I really shouldn't, but I'm going to add the fact that my own constituency MP, who happens to be our prime minister, has shown us in the constituency for the nine and a half years we've been unfortunate enough to have him, that his personal and political instincts are profoundly undemocratic and authoritarian. And already in the couple of months that this government has been in office, we're seeing some of the consequences of that. But I think what it does say to us, and I, and I mean this very seriously, you know, as I mentioned, I've worked in, on this, issue and related issues for almost 23 years now. What Palestine Action has done in the, what, three and a half years of its existence has had more direct impact than anything that I've done in 23 years. That's just the reality of it. Why do I say that? Well, there used to be 10 Elbert factories in the United Kingdom. There are now seven. Elbert lost a specific contract for 284 million pounds directly because the key factory in delivering on that contract, some of the product was destroyed by Palestine action. So these are extraordinarily courageous people who are taking a very different approach to dealing with the arms trade. And at the moment, with the extent to which the arms trade is completely out of control in the world, I actually think that it's probably the most significant and appropriate action to be taking. And I would strongly encourage people to support them and their work in whatever ways you possibly can. Speak to the want? second question. Ah, do, do you want to just say sure. I'll come back off after others have yeah. spoken? I'll speak to the toxic masculinity one, not the public. <laughs> 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 I mean, I think it's a great question, and it's something that I grapple with a lot on my own. And I think on a broader level, I feel very helpless in changing the discourse around what security is. Um, but the points of hope is that we there are so many movements on a grassroots and a, and a community level where people are really defining what security means for them. And that breaks through this idea that sending arms to a faraway country is going to help you in your everyday life. And we have initiatives uh, like Rethinking Security in the UK who are, have been over across several years now been trying to pull together evidence from across the UK on what a security strategy for these people would actually look like. 
And, and when you start giving these people the facts of, of course, it's very easy to be drawn into when, when state power and media tells you that more arms provide national security, it's very difficult for an everyday person to break through that narrative. But when you're being given the facts of the incredible ineffectiveness of the system and all the money that's being wasted um, in this space and, and the fact that it's not even, doesn't even make sense on a military strategy point of view, then, and you ask them a question rather about whether or not their kids uh, can afford uh, lunch in school or if they're going to have heating during the winter. And, and that changes the discourse very quickly. And I also find it interesting to speak about my personal experiences of this, whatever we call it, toxic masculinity or this chauvinism or this de facto social violence that plays out in this space. Because when you hear from someone living that social violence from the people who are arguing that they're providing your security and your defense, and you can, and you, there, that just by entering into that space, or that camera is exposed, right? You can see the underlying interests and the, the, the motivations driving that space. And when I get to talk to people about those experiences, that also breaks, has a certain power to break through. Um, but in the broader scheme of things, I have no idea. Because yeah. <laughs> we, what are we going to do against material power? <laughs> Dan, do you want to come in before I, I say I mean, some I, I, words? I mean, if we're talking about why Labour's sort of, insofar as it has changed its policy on arms and insofar as it hasn't, I mean, direct action undi undeniably has its place. I don't know if it's had much impact on Labour thinking, though, in reality. I think what's had impact on Labour thinking is pressure within the Labour movement, concern that they've got a difficult party conference coming up as activists who want to make points about what's going on in Gaza uh, and, 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 and similarly, and you saw some of that pressure in the election where although of course Labour won a landslide, it, 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 you know, it failed to win certain inner city seats, particularly where there was a, uh, a significant Muslim, Muslim population or electorate. And so I think those are the kind of pressures that, that would get do get politicians to reflect. In other words, uh, when votes are when, when their votes are threatened, or when they're sort of going to have a sort of difficult party conference and so on and so forth. That's not to say that direct action isn't important, um, or as I say, has its ro has its role. But I I think it would be a one well, wish it were otherwise. But I think it'd be a stretch to say it had much impact on political thinking um, within Labour, and certainly not within the Conservatives. Thanks. Yeah, I want to come in on the nationalisation thing. Uh, I, I deal with this a bit in um, uh, the report. And um, while I have a definite view on this, I'm not convinced. I can see the argument. If, if the problem is you've got these profit-making companies, you know, basically, through whatever means, buying their way into getting these contracts and... Um, influencing government policy to, to help out their shareholders, take away that profit mo motive, nationalise them, bring them under government control. They're no longer an independent actor that can influence government. They're now under our control, so we can decide, well, what do we actually want to do? I think the problem is, first, in terms of, you know, actually observing what happens when you've got nationalised arms industries, it's not really any better. Uh, so you, you can look at Russia and China, uh, who have um, nas um, nationalised arms industries. They're not role models. Of course, uh, they're also not democracy. But even if you look at France, which um, has significant uh, sections of the arms industry under public ownership, not all of it, but, but uh, and pre previously it was even more direct public control, um, just as much corruption, if not more. Indeed, the fact that, for example, Naval Group, the uh, yeah, which does what it says on the label, was under direct public control, meant that French politicians in the 90s could use it directly to channel bribes back to their own political campaigns. So the, the, the fact that it was under public control actually increased corruption. But... Looking at institutionally, even if you've taken out the profit motive, you've not taken out what 
fellow panelists have told, uh, talked about, the money flowing through the whole system. The fact that the people running these companies, even if they are publicly owned companies, the people in charge of them still have their own personal financial and career interests. And if you're worried about the arms industry becoming effectively a part of the state, well, making it actually a part of the state is in some ways making it worse. Um, so I, I can see there's, a, uh, there's an argument for it, and I think in some areas of it, it might even be a good idea. Like nuclear submarines, there's only ever going to be one producer. It's an actual monopoly. Maybe if you're going to still be producing nuclear submarines, then it would make sense to have that... Um, as, as something that's publicly owned. So I wouldn't rule it out in all cases, but I also wouldn't see it as a solution to the underlying problem um, that, that, that this uh, re re report exposes. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much to Sam, Dan, Nico, and Andrew. And I would also like to thank our audience, me audience members and encourage you to read the full report which is available on both CAT's website and WPF's website. I also note that we will be sending a registered m email to all of the people who um, signed up for this event asking for feedback, and we will be providing you with the report link so you don't have to search for it. I uh, would just last say thank you so much again, and please give our speakers a round of applause. And thank you very much, Dean. B has not only moderated tonight, but she's played a huge role in the long process of editing and refining this report and giving me much needed um, boots up the behind from time to time to actually get it and done, as well. as well as Bridget from World Peace Foundation. So thank you, B. Of course, thank you. Mm.